This is Lesson 16, 6, Women in Science and the Enlightenment. How did attitudes towards women during the 17th and 18th centuries impact their participation in science and the Enlightenment? And what I find very interesting is that this doesn't have any direct reference, references to any items on the College Board course exam description. Very interesting. Places we're still talking about England, France, Germany. Key women. We've got Margaret Cavendish, Maria Winkelmann, Dorothea Schlitzer, Marie Mordrach, Emily du Chatelet, and Maria Marion. And so these are the women that we're going to focus on. Intro. Humanism provided a nudge for some men to encourage women to gain more education, like Geoffrey Chaucer and Giovanni Boccaccio. And women could not come from humble origins if they wanted to get an education. To be a woman in science, you had to have several unlikely things going for you. Number one, you had to come from elite society. Number two, you had to show exceptional promise. Number three, you had to have an influential man in your life who believed in you, whether that was a husband or a father or a brother. Number four, you had to be socially presentable. Otherwise, your chances of getting any kind of a formal education for science were not good. Now, we've already seen that men commonly viewed women as intellectually and morally inferior to themselves. Christine de Pizan wrote extensively on that subject. We studied her. And educated women were often viewed negatively. They were viewed as strange, socially awkward, reclusive, neurotic, flaky, frumpy, or unfeminine. And they were viewed as having had to overcome their inherent liabilities in order to get where they were. They must have constantly heard things such as, oh, you must have had to overcome a lot being a woman. Or the highest praise that a female writer could expect to get from a man was, wow, she writes so well, you can't even tell it's a woman writing it. Science was no friend to women. In anatomy, it was discovered that you could examine a human skeleton and tell whether that skeleton was a, from a male or a female. And male anatomists started drawing female skeletons in their books differently. They emphasized larger pelvis. They emphasized the smaller skull. And these slight differences were used as scientific evidence that women were the child bearers and men were the thinkers. And this is another example of how science is not the empirical, impartial determiner of what is true and what is not that we like to think it is. Scientific academies tended to exclude women. There were highly influential scientific academies all over Europe, the Royal Society of London, the French Academy of Sciences, the Berlin Academy of Sciences, the Royal Academy of Sciences of Bologna, lots of others in Spain and Sweden and Portugal, etc. And it's not that they had specific rules against female members that were spelled out, didn't need them. You have to apply to join and women almost never got their applications approved. Many men were afraid that it would reflect badly on their own academies to take on women, no matter how brilliant they were, no matter how accomplished they were. However, if you were lucky, there were informal means of getting access to the scientific community if you were willing and eager enough to find those open doors. Some women worked hands-on in the laboratories themselves. This was particularly true in Germany, and we'll talk about why it's true in Germany in a few minutes. Some women wrote influential treatises on scientific topics, and this was particularly true in France and England. Some women were groundbreaking for the high levels of education that they were able to attain. Let's start with Margaret Cavendish, who lived from 1623 to 1673. She was English. She was an aristocrat. She was also the Duchess of Newcastle. She was not an actual hands-on scientist. Instead, Margaret Cavendish wrote extensively about science, and she reflected on science, and she helped people understand the role of science in their own lives. 
1667, Margaret Cavendish was allowed to attend, not become a member, but to attend a meeting of the Royal Society of London. Not allowed to become a member. And in 1668, Margaret Cavendish published Observations Upon Experimental Philosophy. And in this book, she attacked the idea that humans could conquer nature through science. We still think that today. Look at all the things that we can't seem to fix with science. For example, global warming. Science will say, well, put less carbon in the atmosphere. Take carbon out of the atmosphere, to which anybody could say, good, now science me a way to make that cost effective in the short term so it doesn't hurt so much to do that. Also, in 1668, Margaret Cavendish published a kind of pre-science fiction companion to her book, and it was called The Descriptions of a New World, called The Blazing World. And in the story, you entered this world through the North Pole. The stars in this world were all different, so it's somewhere really different. It had lots of fantastical creatures. It was a, a satirical story. It was a utopian slash dystopian story. It had autobiographical elements in it. A young woman is the hero, and she enters the blazing world in order to save her homeland. Fantastical stories were not new. In fact, during this time, novels just about traveling to the moon were so popular that they were a literary genre unto themselves. Margaret Cavendish's story was not about going to the moon. But the most significant thing about The Blazing World was that Margaret Cavendish used her scientific knowledge to bolster the story and make it more believable. And you can actually download this book on your Kindle for $4. Maria Meridian, who lived from 1647 to 1717, you know, here's the question. Who makes the best assistant for a scientist? You know, scientific laboratories have a lot in common with regular workshops. For example, they both produce sketches and graphs. They both have many similar tools. They both often make things. They both require precise measurements of things. And in Germany, there was more of a tradition of women assisting in such workshops than there was in England and France. And this meant that lots of women learned lots of skills that were essential in the laboratory. And this translated to more women assisting in scientific labs. And Maria Marion was an entomologist. In other words, she studied bugs. And she got her training in her stepfather's workshop. And he was Jacob Marel. And he was a still-life painter. And that's where she learned to make excellent illustrations. And Maria excelled in drawing, painting, and engraving. And to paint, she had to use watercolors because the guild system did not allow women to use oil. So she was actually forced by a guild to use watercolors. And she illustrated and published for decades. Marianne published The Caterpillar's Marvelous Transformation and Strange Floral Food in 1679. And those are her drawings. In 1699, Maria Marianne traveled to the Dutch colony of Suriname in South America, and she spent two years traveling around the colony, and her project was actually funded by the Dutch West India Company, and she illustrated lots of insects there, and these illustrations were printed from engravings that Maria Marianne did on copper plates, and she paid particular attention to documenting the life cycles of these animals. And she eventually got malaria and had to return to Europe. She published a collection of 60 of her illustrations called Metamorphosis of the Insects of Suriname in 1705. And in this book, Maria Marian also condemned the treatment of slaves by the Dutch in Suriname. And she knew it was bad because she actually had a slave assigned to assist her for the two years that she was there. And she also criticized Dutch merchants for their total lack of appreciation for Suriname's natural beauty. And what she wrote in her book about that was, the people there have no desire to investigate anything like that. Indeed, they mocked me 
for seeking anything other than sugar in the country. We know how important sugar was. Maria Marion continued to work until she died in 1717, even after she suffered a stroke in 1715. And here's the weird thing. The death register when she died listed her profession as pauper. In this portrait, George Gazelle shows off Maria Marion's scientific credentials with the globe, books, prints, a plant, a shell collection, and her engraving needles. Maria Winkelmann, 1670 to 1720. Uh, astro astronomy observatories were often family run, and lots of young girls had training working for their fathers in these observatories. And in fact, Tycho Brahe's sister, Sophia, assisted him in his observatory and even became a recognized scientist herself. Of course, they were Danish, but Denmark is right there to the north of Germany. And between 1670 and 1710, one out of seven astronomers in Germany were women. And Maria Winkelmann was actually raised in an observatory, and she was taught by her father, her uncle, and an astronomer neighbor. And Maria Winkelmann married into astronomy. Her husband was Berlin's astronomer royal, Gottfried Kirch. And he was appointed first astronomer of the Royal Academy of Sciences in Berlin. He became the director of the Berlin Observatory, run by the Royal Academy of Sciences in Berlin. And together they had several children, and the family lived in a house on the observatory grounds. And Maria Winkelmann discovered a previously unknown comet, along with many other, other discoveries shared with Gottfried. Well, Maria's husband Gottfried died in 1710, and so Maria applied to the, to the academy for his position, and she was turned down because she did not have a degree. Instead, the academy appointed her son, Christfried, whom she had trained. That must have been a bitter pill to swallow. Maria Winkelmann continued to work in the family business of astronomy as her son, Christfried's employee. Then, male academy members complained that she was, quote, too visible at the observatory when strangers visit, and they ordered her to retire to the background and leave the talking to her son. Well, she refused to take that lying down, so they forced her to move out of the house on the observatory grounds. And Maria continued working privately until she died of a fever in 1720. Marie Mordrach, 1610 to 1680. She was French. She was a proto-feminist. She was a chemist and an alchemist. And in 1666, Marie Mordrach published a book called Useful and Simple Chemistry for the Benefit of Ladies. And scholars have debated on what this book really is. Is it a chemistry book? Is it an alchemy book? Is it a medical cookbook? Is it a combo of all three? It was approved for use by the Faculty of Medicine in Paris, and it was very popular and went through numerous editions and translations. But one of the most important parts of Useful and Simple Chemistry for the Benefit of Ladies was the book's introduction, and in it, Marie Mordrach gave a very illuminating description of how women were taught to behave in a male dominated society. And the most important thing she said in her introduction was this, the mind has no sex. In other words, the ability to think, the ability to reason, the ability to learn, the ability to comprehend, the, the ability to be creative, the ability to be imaginative, these are aspects of the mind that transcend gender. And then Emily du Châtelet, 1706 to 1749. She was French. She wrote the, that's bold letters, the standard French translation of Isaac Newton's Principia that is still used today. Its longer name was Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Newton had written it in Latin, and she translated it into French. And she actually discovered an additional law of the conservation of energy while she was working 
on the translation. And she also added important commentary to the translation, and she completed it the year of her death. Her translation made her famous throughout Europe. She was already famous in France. She also predicted the existence of infrared light. And in 1740, she wrote the very popular Foundations of Physics. And she also contributed many articles to Denis Diderot's Encyclopedia. Emily du Châtelet also had a very close romantic relationship with Voltaire. And in 1738, Voltaire published Elements of the Philosophy of Newton. And this is a picture of the inside of the front cover. Inside the front cover, Voltaire had a picture of Newton shining the light of knowledge down upon him. But that light is reflected by a mirror held by Emily du Châtelet. And the, the idea behind this picture, the message is, I could not have done this without her. Emily du Châtelet fell madly in love with, with Voltaire's friend, the poet Jean-Francois de Saint-Lambert, and the affair was very scandalous. Lots of people made fun of it in the press. And in 1749, she died of a fever six days after giving birth to Saint-Lambert's baby. She was only 42 years old. All of Europe was shocked. Voltaire was devastated. She had actually confided to a friend that she did not think she would survive the pregnancy. And the ironic thing was that the delivery itself had been actually very easy and free of problems. And this made it even more shocking when she suddenly died six days later. And then we've got Dorothea von Röder Schlötzer, 1770 to 1825. She was German. She was the first German woman to get a doctorate, and she had to fight extra hard for that doctorate. Women were not allowed to study at the University of Göttingen, and she had to endure a particularly rigorous private faculty examination. Dorothea von Röder Schlötzer's father was a historian and an educational theorist, and he saw to it that Dorothea had an extensive education on a bet. He had a bet going with another parent that one particular educational theory was better than another one. And so he kind of put his daughter on the line, you know, to, to win that bet. Dorothea had the advantage of being more, quote, presentable than many other female scholars. She dressed fashionably. She could play the piano. She knew how to knit and sew and run a household. But she also excelled and wrote on a wide range of topics, including mathematics, botany, zoology, optics, mining, and mineralogy. 